Good morning and welcome to the Seek Sustainable Japan podcast. I'm your host, JJ Walsh, here in Hiroshima, Japan. And in this episode, I had the chance to talk with peace educator and pro wrestler and peace activist living in Hiroshima, Japan for a long time, Ashley Souther. Now, Ashley uh, is one of the teachers in Japan who is working with Japanese students on the official peace education studies, as well as teaching communication studies. But he has had experience living and meeting people in Gaza himself. So in his classes in this episode, he talks about connecting real students in Gaza with his students in Japan and how that really transformed the whole idea of what is peace and made it more real to them. Hi everyone and welcome. This is Seek Sustainable Japan. I am JJ Walsh and today I am joined by Ashley Souther. Hey, what's up you guys? <laughs> so we are both in Hiroshima and it's really fun to get together with Ashley. Now, Ashley, you have had such a colorful, very interesting career in Hiroshima and around the world. You are a peace activist. You are a peace educator, and you called yourself the wrestler of peace for a while. So also pro wrestling mixed in there, right? Yes. Yeah, it goes hand in hand. Pro wrestling and peace, of course, right? Now we see the posters behind you. Maybe let's start <laughs> with pro wrestling. How did that start? How did you get into pro wrestling? Was it like a dream as a kid? Did you watch it growing up? Um, I watched it growing up. Uh, I grew up in the South. Um, so, you know, it was always like a, a guilty pleasure, Kung Fu movies and pro wrestling. Um, and I, I never thought it was something that I should actually do. Cause that's not something you think. You don't see that and say like, I want to do that. At least I did it. Um, uh, however, I came to it in a weird way, um, in the West Bank town of Janine. So, <laughs> so I grew up watching wrestling like a lot of kids uh, growing up in the South. Uh, there were three things that people talked about um, in the South uh, at my, when I was in, a young kid, uh, hunting, truck and tractor pull, and professional wrestling. So, um, <laughs> and um, so when I was actually uh, teaching at the West Bank uh, uh, town of Janine uh, at a university, um, I had done like, regular like quote unquote real wrestling um and i wanted to make a club for the kids there uh because like in the west bank in palestine um you know it's under occupation and and people don't have freedom and so my idea was that they could just feel a little bit of freedom through sports uh and through the sport of uh, professional wrestling um so i started a wrestling club at the university uh in janine uh, and then people kept telling me about this old man who did wrestling um, in the refugee camp in Janine. And I just kept hearing from people, you know, because they associated like wrestling with this old man that lived in this um, refugee camp. So I was like, I got to go see him because I'm kind of a, a jump in kind of a guy. So I went to the refugee camp in Janine and, and I met this old guy named Haj Diab. And he actually didn't do wrestling he did professional wrestling and i didn't realize they they associated the two they couldn't tell the difference you know i mean for them like wrestling was wrestling um and this guy haj diab he had a completely handmade ring like it was like dusty rusty like thrown together patchwork ring in a rinky dink you know you go up these crumbly uh concrete stairs uh, into a really stanky gym. And so it was just perfect. And I fell in love with it, um, you know, from at first sight. And I told Haj Diab, I said, you know, I, I said, I want to be, you know, train me, you know. Um, and so I started training at that little gym uh, in Janine refugee camp uh, with a bunch of other kids. And um, the cool thing about really, uh, the really cool thing about Haj Diab was that he trained kids in wrestling, not like to become professional wrestlers or anything like that, but just to get them off the streets. 
uh, because at that time, you know, kids uh, in occupied West Bank, you know, there was a lot of pitfalls um, and, you know, under occupation, Israeli army, you know, kids, they're, they're wild. Um, they'll l literally throw rocks at like Israeli jeeps and, and tanks coming through, you know, the occupying army, you know, and then, you know, get into big trouble, get arrested or worst. So he wanted to like protect them from that. And he used a uh, wrestling, um, as a way, uh, to protect them from that. And, you know, you know, put their energies into a, a, a productive, um, avenue. So I was so impressed with that. And uh, that's where I actually started professional wrestling uh, in Janine um, and then came and debuted in Japan. Sorry, that was, it's a crazy story, but. That is a crazy story. Oh my gosh. Well, a lot of people wouldn't realize that we have pro wrestling circuit in Japan. We have our own Hiroshima pro wrestling circuit called <laughs> Dove Pro Wrestling, right? Look at that mm -hmm. cup you're drinking from, this is crazy. <laughs> And so you uh, were different kind of variations, you different different mm. costumes, right? Um, different names. How did you, you started this money character, is it? <laughs> Lover? Right. So, so that, yes, yes, yes. So that's a, a funny thing. Actually, professional wrestling is huge here in Japan, and it's much more respected uh, by normal people than it is in the United States, um, which also made it really nice to wrestle in Japan. Because uh, So I wrestled in different promotions. Uh, thankfully, one of them was Kyushu Prodesu. Yeah, and I was down there in Kyushu. And the cool thing about Kyushu Prodesu, and I'm going to put them over here uh, because they deserve it, uh, is that each character in Kyushu Pro Wrestling is from a meibutsu of Kyushu, right? So one of the famous things of Kyushu. So you have um, Asozan is a big mountain in Kyushu. You have the wrestler Asozan, who's a big dude. Uh, you have uh, Mentaiko is like a really is a meibutsu, uh, a famous food in Kyushu. Uh, That's some... spicy fish eggs for anyone who doesn't speak Japanese, right? Thank you, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Uh, and so we have Mentai Kid, who's also a wrestler. Um, and so. Actually, a uh, little known outside of Kyushu, but Thomas Glover was like a historical figure. He was Scottish. Uh, he became like a super rich by selling guns to samurai, uh, as I understand it. Um, and he built a mansion in Nagasaki called Glover Te. The Te means mansion. So Grabate uh, is like a really famous spot uh, in Nagasaki. So you have this Thomas Glover, this famous rich, you know, white guy uh, from history. So their great idea was to have me play uh, this character Glover. And I would just be basically like a rich, um, you know, white bad guy. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm one of those three things. <laughs> oh man, that is it was a lot crazy. of fun, super fun, a lot of fun. And then you had a different persona with big bull horns. Was that your most recent no. version? Yeah. So, uh, so I live and work here in Hiroshima. Uh, as do you, as as we have since the 90s. Um, so here, people know me, so I can't really, like, pretend to be a bad guy because, yeah, come on. Um, so I was a, a good guy, or as we say, a face uh, in the business uh, here in Hiroshima. And I just went by my real name, Salza. Um, so my gimmick was, I really, my, my gimmick wasn't a gimmick. It was just me going out there, just being, you know, hamming it up. But um, I always, for any wrestling fans, you'll know, like, the Road Warriors. Uh, they, they went out there with shoulder pads with spikes on them. And I loved that as a kid. So I was like, all right, I'm going to have shoulder pads with bull horns on them. So that's what I did. And that was my thing, <laughs> coming out to the ring. Wow. I, I saw one picture where you were hugging someone. You had the bull horns. And I was like, oh, no. That looks dangerous, but so much of pro rest looks dangerous, right? But it's it's all rehearsed. You guys are really talented at at like holding each other, throwing each other around. You said you did this to TV presenters, 
Like, how did they handle this? This is crazy. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, yeah, pro wrestling and pro wrestlers, I think they have like a, a special, uh, like heart, a space in, uh, in the heart of Japanese people, you know, because it's so visceral and so like, uh, you know, uh, but no, the, the thing is like, you have to do things that make look, make it look like you're killing someone or being killed while not actually doing so. That's really like the, the art, uh, and the, um, the, uh, the, that's the trick. So like, looking like it make it hurt uh when it doesn't actually hurt that much that's really like the trick of pro wrestling but of course you know uh at the end of the day it does hurt and you do get busted open and in my last match i got busted open like big time uh with a chair and i was just covered in blood so now you you have always now when i had a a great uh talk that i heard a guy who uh, went around the world uh trying to get landmines taken away and he had such a serious job um, and he lost both of his legs and he still talked about the importance of sense of humor, the mm. importance of connecting with people in other ways. Uh, was that kind of a way for you? Cause it seems like you made such good friendships through pro, pro wrestling and you often did it hand in hand. Like here you talk about, uh, like doing a peace talk and then later on the weekend going and doing pro wrestling. Like how does it, how does it connect or how do you like emotionally, is it a release? Does it just help you to have that balance or? Hmm. So like, absolutely. Um, on two levels. Uh, one was for me, uh, just to, like you said, have that release and, and go out and be able to pick someone up and throw them down, which you really can't do uh, otherwise. Um, <laughs> um, but I think like for me also, like on a deeper level, um, professional wrestling is, is all about like, you're telling a story and, and it's a tori story of confrontation. It's a story of, of uh, two forces come together. Um, and that's really its appeal. Um, is that people, I think, even if they're not like into like, you know, like um, sports and rugby and stuff like that, they realize that there's an aspect of life that is struggle, struggle between opposing forces, you know, uh, struggle with gravity, struggle uh, between plants for sunlight. It's that, 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 that nature uh, is something that I think that uh, on a deep level, uh, we can all relate to. Uh, and especially people uh, who are part of uh, downtrodden uh, or oppressed minorities, you know, because in a typical professional wrestling match, um, you can immediately tell who the good guy and the bad guy is. Because throughout 90% of the match, the, the good guy is getting his butt kicked. Uh, and the bad guy is doing every dirty trick in the book and getting away with it. Uh, therefore, yeah, like every, all the people are getting upset, but in the end, the good guy, um, beyond all odds, you know, raises up in righteous indignity and fury and somehow, uh, defeats all odds to beat the bad guy. And that's something that like we can all identify with, but people like, Palestinians who are living uh, under occupation. I mean, that is just such a powerful message uh, for them. Uh, and uh, it's cathartic. It's a cathartic thing, you know, to see that, yeah, we're getting our butts kicked now, but someday, someday, you know, justice will be served. Um, it's it's uh, very satisfying on a visceral level. Uh, so yeah, and I, I mean, I, I really love professional wrestling because it's the international language in a way, um, you know, whether that's one way that I made friends when I was in Gaza, uh, in Palestine is talking about wrestling and uh, people were like, uh, he must be all right. I've been in like, like, uh, Malawi in Southern Africa where you can't speak 
like I couldn't understand the language and they couldn't understand mine, but I just did this, which is John Cena's You Can't See Me. And they immediately got it. It was like, it was much better than like um, lang communicating by language. Oh, that's amazing. And you, you've had some of your comrades from pro wrestling uh, who've joined <laughs> you, it looks like, in Peace Park for a protest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Chikano Kenshin, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was wild. That was like when worlds collide, you know? Uh, but for me, Hiroshima uh, has always been a place of struggle. And for me, uh, I've been very fortunate and it's been very meaningful for me to wrestle in Hiroshima and be a Hiroshima best based wrestler um, because of the history of Hiroshima. And, uh, and I definitely see the, the story of Hiroshima as being, you know, somehow congruent with that pro wrestling narrative of having gotten beaten down, but not giving up. And eventually, you know, that belief uh, that, that, uh, that justice will be served and that, and, and it's, it's a defiance, you know, it's a defiance. Um, you know, it's a, uh, it's pro wrestling. It's in your face. It's guttural. Um, it's uh, unrepentant, you know? So I really, I really identify with that. For me, pro wrestling and Hiroshima go hand in hand. And you've married into a Japanese family. Uh, your wife's uh, parents were survivors, Hibakusha survivors. So you're very closely connected and raising two kids of your own here in Hiroshima and being an educator. So you're also teaching is kind of like parenting, raising the next generation of people how to think about peace and things. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, yeah. But you, you think you'll live in Hiroshima forever? Is this home for you? Um, uh, no and yes. Uh, it is home for me. It is a home for me. I don't know about forever. I don't know about tomorrow. Uh, but uh, I've adapted Hiroshima. I've adapted Hiroshima uh, as a home uh, for me. Um, and I'm really, I'm really lucky, you know. Um, I'm really glad that I came to this place because I, I feel like Hiroshima has so much to offer the world. Uh, I feel like the quote unquote message of Hiroshima, um, and that I think is different uh, depending on who you ask, but I think it, it has a lot to offer the world and I think a, a lot that's necessary right now. So even if I physically leave Hiroshima, I'm never going to you know leave, leave Hiroshima. Just how... Um, I'm not currently in Palestine, but I'm still connected to Gaza. I still feel Gaza is a home. Gaza is a home. Hiroshima will always be a home. Yeah, that's amazing. Now, a lot of people, um, I do tours at least once a week in Peace Park and around Hiroshima uh, for <laughs> visitors. And I think one of the most powerful things that I talk about when they see loads of kids coming around and uh, viewing Peace Park, going to the Children's Monument, uh, yeah. placing their beautiful uh, peace cranes that they've worked on at school. And I talk about yeah. how all kids in Japan have peace education. And this is something my kids went through and this is something that you've been really passionate about. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in teaching peace education at your school? So, uh, like, I, <laughs> I would be interested in comparing notes with you. Um, like, my first exposure or my first, uh, my first meeting or first uh, um, exposure to peace education uh, in Hiroshima was that of surprise and also disdain. Um, like, growing up in the States, um, you know, we didn't have peace education. And, like, the military was just generally seen in a positive light, as was everything that America did. Um, so to come here and to, first of all, you know, be in Hiroshima and, and be reminded of, uh, of the atomic bombing, but also like at that time when I first came here in uh, 1997, 1998, 
uh, Hiroshima, uh, the peace education here at that time was very strong. The teachers union was very strong. Um, and they did their own thing. They didn't, um, uh, you know, I, I think um, the audience probably knows of uh, textbook issues, struggles with how uh, history is taught. That's a big thing in, in our country and, and here as well. Uh, but at that time, Hiroshima did its own thing when it come when it came to history and when it came to peace education, and it was really strong. And they were very clear about portraying militarism and the military and nationalism as a negative thing, and that was like a shock to me. You know, um, I remember uh, we uh, when I first came here uh, teaching at a school we went on a peace trip down to Okinawa and we were supposed to meet, go to Futenma Kichi, which is an American military base uh, in the middle of uh, Naha, I think, I'm not sure, in Okinawa. Uh, and I was thinking, oh, sweet, we're gonna get some hot dogs, maybe some pizza, see some cool, you know, uh, F-16s or something like that. And it was not that at all. It was like the opposite. We didn't even go into the base. Uh, we went, we climbed a mountain and looked down on it and the uh, so social studies teacher lectured to the kids about like what a detriment the base was and um, all the terrible things that, you know, uh, the accidents that happened and uh, the legal issues. And I was shocked because it was portraying, you know, America and American military in a negative light, which is the first time, you know, I had been exposed to that. Um, so that really like started me thinking um, about like you know peace education and um, at first I was really strongly against it but it did like start me thinking about like questioning my whole worldview you know uh, which I had developed you know growing up in rural America in western Kansas you know um, so yeah that was my first push with uh, peace education here um, and then I left Japan and I went to uh, Gaza. Um, and then I went to grad school in the States, in DC, at American University and studied peace and uh, um, a conflict resolution, international conflict resolution. Um, and then I came back to Japan. And when I came back in 2005, like the peace education that I had met with uh, in the late 90s was completely gone. And that's something that I wrote about um, in for my thesis, for my uh, master's thesis at Hiroshima City University. Like what happened to uh, Hiroshima peace education? And that's that's uh, an interesting story. I don't know how much you know about that. No, can you give us a little summary? I haven't heard much about that. I haven't, I mean, besides my kids going through it, I don't really yeah. see it from the inside. I, I wasn't teaching peace education. I was teaching at university. We weren't doing it. It's really junior high and yeah. high school that do it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's wild. Uh, like a lot of that has changed so much uh, since the 90s. Um, and now, like this is my opinion, is like what you get is a lot of like watered down peace education. You know what I mean? It's like peace education that's just like, hey, everyone has their own idea of peace, and that's fine. Um, and that's really easy to do because no one can disagree with it. However, are you addressing like the real issues? Um, and you get really weird things like the G7 where you have, it's in Hiroshima, it's about Hiroshima. Oh, and here's this arms deal that we're doing, you know, um, selling weapons and militarization. and um, a lot of people like from the old school are like, wait a minute, that's not, you know, that's not Hiroshima. That's not what it's supposed to be about. Um, because the motto of Hiroshima is, uh, we would not repeat the mistake, you know? So I think that's really important that first of all, we, we recognize like what was the mistake, you know? Um, and if that gets like watered down and if it gets to be something that like, oh, you know, just it's all different opinions and everyone's has their own, um, you know, take on it and that's fine. 
then like it's really hard to make sure that we we recognize that a it was a mistake b how did it happen and c what's happening right now that resembles that if not exactly the same but uh in the ways that are important yeah um what i was working with a local media company when obama came and this is one of the stories i tell uh, when i take people around peace park and i was helping transcribe what he was saying so that they could add the japanese subtitles and it was a really amazing time to be a part of that project and after uh that subtitle project was done at the end they kept asking me did he apologize and mm -hmm. he never said the word sorry and that was very mm -hmm. calculated that was that wow. would have been too political right mm -hmm. but he definitely was empathetic and it was so important that a sitting u.s president came and hugged survivors and talked to them um now you wrote uh to in the chugo kushimbun also talking about the wording the translation of what is written on the cenotaph yeah. can you yeah. tell about yeah. that yeah 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 um first of all uh, that's awesome <laughs> that you did that um what's written on the cenotaph uh is uh yes i am i believe uh which means um uh rest in peace uh for we shall not repeat the mistake now the official translation is rest in peace for we shall not uh, repeat the evil that's the english translation however in japanese ayamachi uh, the word ayamachi ayamachi okurikai sanai the wording is it means mistake so it, 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 was, it was like first of all i was like wait a minute what because like you know we we all um like from our knowledge of japanese we know that ayamachi means mistake why is the official translation um, we shall not repeat the evil. Um, now, first of all, I give all the respect to the person who came up with that because that's what they wanted it to be. And I think that the quote unquote official uh, translation comes from the actual person who, who made that. Um, at the same time, I am of the mind that I think it should be, we will not repeat the mistake instead of we were, not, we were not we will not repeat the evil the reason is that although i completely agree that what happened was evil you know um however when we categorize what happened as evil um we make it like far away we make it like something that's um distant from us you know um a mess Mistakes are something that happen all the time. We all make some mistakes uh, to err as human, right? However, something that's evil, that's in a different category. Uh, and so my idea is that the important thing about remembrance when it comes to Hiroshima or when it comes to Holocaust or when it comes to anything is yes, being respectful and remembering the people who died and suffered at that time how all at the same time and maybe even arguably more important making sure that doesn't happen again um and i think that we should not repeat the mistake gives us that message like be careful be careful they didn't set out to do something evil they were like <laughs> you guys ready to get evil no they were just going about their normal thing and they were able to justify it right and and people still justify it like they're like yeah well you know it's more complicated and the, that word complicated is used to justify so many horrible things you know um so like like i like the translation of uh mistake because i feel like it puts the onus a little bit more on us to look around like what are we doing I, you know we need to be careful and not to make that mistake or not to go down that path i think that's really important i i really i appreciate your point of view and i appreciate you writing it in japanese and creating that important discussion that really should be happening 
and and that's another thing i when you came to hiroshima just like when i first visited hiroshima the museum was very different uh they had mannequins with hanging off skin and and blood coming down and it was really shocking and i remember coming to hiroshima as an american anyway with a heavy heart and and then seeing that and being shocked but right next to me were the cutest little kids saying hello hello are you american cool and it was blowing my mind did that contrast now it is the mannequins are gone but there are people who say it should be shocking because it was shocking it was horrible um mm. and but the fact that the museum the narratives um there are people really working hard to make it fair and accurate and honest and i do see that transition and i think in that way it does connect to peace education as well and i i appreciate being in hiroshima where we have the opportunity to think about these things right and to have students thinking about these things so you're you're right sometimes it's it's too clean or it's too abstract it's too other but in many ways we're lucky to be here and have the chance to think about it right i totally agree i totally agree now you you had a uh, uh, recent nhk uh, show featuring you and and doing peace education and um, one of the really amazing things uh, they focused on in the show was how you were able to really connect your Japanese students with students in Gaza in fact you brought students over from Gaza to Japan how did you do that what an amazing chance to have that exchange for your students and for those students <coughs> Tell us a bit about that. Well, actually, like I didn't bring them. Um, I was just in the right place at the right time. Um, with they were they were coming to Japan uh, on an UNRWA sponsored trip, um, and UNRWA. Some people say UNRWA. Uh, I say UNRWA. Some people say UNRWA. The United Nations Relief and Works Agency, um, the UN agency that's responsible for uh, supporting Palestinian refugees. Uh, so they were coming on a trip, and these were three kids uh, chosen out of the, the millions of kids uh, in Gaza to represent Gaza, to represent uh, their people and their struggles uh, to Japan in order to try to, you know, uh, get more uh, uh, funding and, and support for UNRWA. Uh, the reason that they came to my school is because I had an ongoing uh, exchange with uh, the kids in Gaza, just because that's something that's really important to me and something that um, I've always seen as a way that I can contribute uh, is to connect the kids that I teach now uh, to the people that uh, I knew and still have a great relationship with uh, in Gaza. Uh, so we were super lucky. Uh, they came to my school in Takeda High School in Higashi Hiroshima. Um, and those kids, you know, Fadi, uh, Lama, Janan are just amazing. They're just the most amazing kids. You know, and uh, they just remind me of why I love Gaza so much, because it's just full of life and people who really, really value the things that are really, really important. Um, anyway, um, about connecting Gaza with Hiroshima, like, I see that as the best thing that I can do uh, as a teacher in my position. Like, I'm not like super duper smart um and i'm not like really good at you know like writing and putting ideas together and like dealing with complex um things however um i do have friends over here and people that um i communicate and i love over here and i do have people over here that i'm connected with and that i love over here and so like my idea is like maybe i can connect it Maybe if I can just be a conduit uh, between those two people, because it's not just something that I believe, but it's something that I've witnessed and I do witness is that when you get people together, they want to connect. All you have to do is get them together and step back and get out of the way. And that's what I love seeing is that magic moment when people feel that 
that magic and that electricity of connecting together and recognizing the humanity uh, in the other person. And I don't know what that is. I can't explain it. I'm definitely not responsible for it, but I do recognize it. And I feel on some level that that's the best thing I can do for peace. Absolutely. That's awesome. Um, now, the story of these three young people from Gaza um, is really ongoing still. They weren't able to get back, right? And you did part of the NHK program, they showed how um, you did a presentation, your students tried to to take them away from their their worries for a little while doing a tour of Japan. Um, but tell yeah. us a bit, uh, but do you have any updates on what's going on with them? So, I mean, <laughs> anyone who deals with Palestine or is connected with Palestine knows that it's, it's, uh, it's really good at one thing. And that thing is like, just when you think it can't get any worse, it does. And uh, <laughs> that's, so <clears throat> it was so crazy because they came to our school and these are kids that are like 14 years old. And one of them said, I'm 14 years old. I've lived through five wars. And the very next day, number six started um, on October 7th. They were here at my school on October 6th. And so therefore, uh, they were not able to return home. I wish, honestly, that they had just stayed in Japan. Uh, they made it back to Jordan, and they've been in Jordan um, at a refugee camp in Amman, Jordan. Um, because not there are not only Palestinian refugee camps um, in occupied Palestinian territories, but also in neighboring countries, uh, in Lebanon and Jordan, uh, run by the same uh, UN organization that sponsored their trip. So they have been um, in Amman, Jordan, uh, since for about a half a year almost. Um, and we have been continuing um, contact with them. And they have expressed a uh, desire to come and, and uh, study in Hiroshima. And so, like right now, I am like working with different people and talking to different people and, uh, and trying to, you know, hopefully make that a reality. Uh, that you know because like now all the schools in Gaza are destroyed so as much as they want to be reunited with their families their families know that you know like what are the, the realistic um, you know possibilities for the future in Gaza it's pretty pretty dark if they have an opportunity to study here in Japan um, here in Hiroshima then that is something that um, they want to pursue and have been, um, you know, have said that they wanted to do. So right now, I'm just trying to trying to keep that connection um, and try to like connect them with more people uh, that can hopefully make that happen. Oh, that would be amazing. Um, we we know that Japan is is very famous for accepting very few asylum seeker, seekers and immigrants um but you know with your connections here and the fact that they've already been here i love seeing that video uh you shared with me of of him getting the bento and eating with the other kids and it's just so heartwarming and your students got to know them on a personal level uh hearing the response of your students and what they said uh, really deeply understanding that it really could be anyone. These these are not others. These these are friends. Yeah. These are real people. And I think that was one of your big targets for for everything you do and and talk about in peace education and in your work with school kids, right? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I've like nothing. Nothing has made me happier than knowing that some of my students who met uh, Janan and Fadi and Lama at that time still keep in contact with them. And uh, some of them like graduated um, in, uh, in April and, and now they're in college. And, they, and I still hear that they still keep in contact with them, you know? Um, and uh, some of my students also 
uh, were so moved uh, by meeting them and, and seeing what happened uh, on the news that they have been uh, motivated to go down to Peace Park and join the candlelight vigil uh, for the ceasefire uh, that happens like every night uh, in the Peace Park. So, you know, like it's not a lot. It's not like, you know, in the tens, but uh, it's a few kids. And to me, when I see that, I'm like, okay, well, at least I'm doing something. <laughs> <clears throat> Can you tell us a little bit about the, the protest in front of the A-bomb dome? It's such an iconic, it's a UNESCO World Heritage site now since 1996. Um, it's often the site um, that people commemorate uh, the banning of nuclear weapons uh, without consequence, right? They, they have a big uh, memorial of that. Of course, August 6th, it's a concentrated area of protests, all kinds of protests. Um, I always, it really strikes me to see the Buddhist monks chanting and sitting there and beating a drum and I asked them what are they chanting about and they said we have to bring that positive energy from the center of the earth because we need it humanity needs it and I was like yes absolutely <laughs> you know whether you believe it or not you're just yeah, so no, no. grateful people yeah. are so passionate about the future of humanity and this world, it's, it's really powerful place to be. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah. Yeah. People talk the, about the power of place. Um, and um, that place there in Peace Park at the atomic bomb dome, uh, it has a lot of power. Um, it's a beautiful park. Uh, and at the same time, it shows the ugliness of, of, uh, of human being, of humankind, of human nature. Us literally at it, our worst, arguably. Um, so the visual community, uh, which has been going on shortly after the war started in, um, in November of last year, um, is an amazing community. Uh, of people who who give a hoot, you know, and who see the connection between Hiroshima, what happened in Hiroshima, and what is happening in Gaza right now. Um, no, it wasn't, it, they're not dropping atomic bombs, uh, depleted uranium maybe, but not atomic bombs. Uh, no, it's not on the scale, and I <laughs> I keep saying that, but the, the amount of uh, casualties keeps going up in, in Gaza, but you know, in the way that, you know, dropping bombs on civilians, like in that respect, uh, the connection. Um, and um, so I have been very blessed to be a part of that community. Uh, we've got people who work, you know, with the World Friendship Center, um, uh, Malachi, big tall dude. He's, he's a real legend, legend legendary dude. Um, you know, Rebecca. Uh, who is with me at Hiroshima City University is just, you know, an, an uber mensch. Um, <laughs> and then uh, a lot of really great, like, Japanese people who care, um, not just, you know, university preferences, just like normal people, like musicians. We've got dudes that are completely tatted up that are like there, and they're just, they really care. And they're pissed off. They're pissed off. You know, so it's like we don't all see eye to eye on literally everything, but we don't need to. The fact that you can be around people who care and who care enough to take time uh, and to go down there and be down there and, and be in a community with them. Yeah, it's uh, it's really meaningful. I, I sometimes see confrontations uh, with the protesters. Have you had some very difficult but very important conversations with people who object to you being there and protesting or contrary support you guys and and come out and and talk to you about that um it's wild it's really wild it's so wild because like in like five in a five minute span 
you'll get someone that be like, you guys need to get out of here. You're disrespecting this space for your own like political agenda. And that's disgusting. And like, really like, just look at you and just like, you know, like that. And like, you're like, ouch, you know? And then a few minutes later, someone will come up uh, with tears in their eyes and just say, can I give you a hug? Thank you so much. And then you're like, whoa. <laughs> but it's, it's so true. Like you, you really, um, you just get the spectrum uh, of the of the emotions and, and the reactions of people. And especially, you know, Peace Park, you're dealing with people from all over the world, including Israel and the United States, you know? And um, yeah, like for me, the messaging is really important. The words they use and you're like, like I stand for this. Um, and like for me personally, I think it's really um, important to be clear that like, you know, like what I'm standing for um, is not like a nationalist thing. It's not like a political thing. It's a human thing. You know what I mean? Um, it's a human thing. Like we m commemorate the victims of, Hir of Hiroshima, not because they were Japanese, but because they were human beings. And the same in Gaza and the same in Israel. You know, it's that loss of human life, which... I want to object to and I want to raise hell about because I feel like we can't continue to justify it. And so I seek to connect with people, especially people with whom I don't agree with, like on that level, on that common denominator level, hopefully. It's, it's powerful. It's a powerful war. Um, I and tell people of seeing the memorial every August 6th and, and coming many times over the many years that I've lived here. And uh, there's always political speeches. There's always protesters. Um, there's still, even 79 years after this year, there are still survivors who will give testimony. But really, it's when the elementary school kids talk about their vision of peace for the future, that really hits people hard because they're talking from such a place of innocence usually, and they really believe it. And that's hard for us to hear because it's hard for us to believe that that would be possible, that peace or no nuclear weapons is possible. Um, how do you feel? Are you feeling hopeful after you know, everything you've seen, everywhere you've lived, do we have a chance for future peace, Ashley? Where are you at? Tough question. Yeah. First of all, I totally agree with what you said about the children and the power of children. Uh, and that's because I feel like children have a way of, like, subverting ideology. Like, People look, adults look at other adults and are like, oh, you're this or you're that. And they put them into categories. Um, and that's justification not to listen to them or, you know, or to discount what they say. Kids are not like that. Kids can't be put into those categories. Um, like you, it's really, really hard to look at, um, you know, Anne Frank or um, like Hadashi no Gen. Uh, from Hiroshima or these little kids and say like, you know, discount their humanity. You just can't. You, it's, it's really hard. And therefore, like, I feel like that is a place or a way that hopefully we should be able to, you know, realize that the justifications that we have for bombing these people or that people, you know, don't hold water uh, because Yes, they are humans, uh, just like we are. And yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, kids just have a way of cutting through the BS that we continue to tell ourselves to justify all of this militarism. Isn't that crazy? It's like they see it in a more simple way. And why can't we do that? Why can't our common enemies like climate change 
and common enemies, you know, like needing shelter, needing food. Why can't that bring us all together, right? It's it seems simple when you're a kid. And is it you like people use the excuses complicated, but is it is it complicated? Don't we need to just prioritize, right? It, you must get that. And in NHK, the the show they did it with your students, you had you know this part where um, you're not trying to tell them how to think. You're presenting these ideas, and then how do the kids respond? And sometimes that just must lift your heart how they respond with such clarity. That's the way it should be. You're right. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. When that um, that student, you know, you know, she said like it's not worth it. You know. I was actually like playing de devil's advocate and uh, and talking about how why all the reasons why war was uh, was a good thing because it's good for the economy, gets everyone together on the same page and blah, blah, blah. Basically, all the things that, you know, um, nationalists and militarists use. Um, and then the student said, I don't it's not worth it if you're doing all that and people are dying and you're killing people. It's not worth it. So, yeah, you know. Yeah. Can you talk about this graphic a little bit? Do you use this in your classes? I like, I like to draw. I've, I've always liked to draw. I'm not like super good at it. Um, but um, I find that like uh, sometimes pictures uh, help me to say things that I can't like, really uh, articulate. Um, and that is just a picture that I did, and I, I did it in pencils later because I, I felt like that's a little bit more expressive. But um, it's, you know, on Frank, um, and it's Hadashi no Gen, uh, Barefoot Gen, who is the iconic uh, character from the manga about uh, a child who, you know, survived the atomic bombing here in Hiroshima. Um, and then uh, there is the uh the palestinian um girl uh from gaza uh and she was you know famously one of the many many um child victims um of the war uh in gaza uh and in fact uh the the very girl that uh the protesters at columbia university uh, renamed uh, the hall, like Hind Hall, like her name is uh, Hind, um, and uh, they renamed uh, one of the buildings that they occupied uh, Hind Hall after after her. So, like to me, if we can get to the place where we can look at Hadashi uh, Nogen, child victims of Hiroshima, um, and Frank, child victims of of the Holocaust, and the kids that are now dying, like right now, like you know yesterday today uh in gaza like to me like that would be huge if we can just see the shared humanity there it sounds like a super simple thing but you know we have all these like justifications in our mind and we're told that like oh for this reason this is different this is not the same you know what i mean but when you look at those kids you're like how can you say that you know it's not different for them and it shouldn't be for us. Yeah. Well, that's powerful. Um, now we were started the conversation talking about pro wrestling. Uh, that was kind of a thing that you were balancing, like this funny, aggressive, athletic thing. You've retired. What are you? Yeah. What are you doing now? You still in good shape? I see your guns there. <laughs> <laughs> How how do you get your your enthusiasm out in different ways? Are you taking up theater or something? <laughs> oh man, I, you know I, I I try to I try to put it in uh, into uh, my research now and in my into my teaching. Uh, it gives me energy uh, for what I'm trying to do, trying to connect uh, my students here in Hiroshima uh, with the kids in Gaza trying to like emphasize like the time is now you know what i mean like we 
we could talk about no more Hiroshima's. Uh, we talk about never again. Yeah, now, now is the time uh, to do that, and that that takes a lot, a lot of energy. And um, so, yeah, I try to channel it um, into that. Uh, and I, I find, you know, being a part of a community of other people who are upset uh, by what's happening, it really helps. Um, and right now um, I'm working on my uh, dissertation uh, for a PhD at Hiroshima City University at the, um, the, the HBU, the uh, Hiroshima Peace uh, Institute. Um, and um, I'm doing it on Hadashi no Gen, on Barefoot Gen, um, and specifically on the, the, the author of Barefoot Gen, uh, Nakazawa Keiji. So, like, that Barefoot Gen um, is really an iconic uh, uh, manga, um, but I find that at the heart of it um, is anger is an, a sense of anger at what happened, at the injustice that happened. Uh, and this character, Barefoot again, like, he's, he's upset, you know, he's pissed off. And so I kind of like vibe with that a little bit, <laughs> you know, like the pro wrestler in me, you know, because uh, he doesn't like use really, really complicated words or anything, uh, but he, recognizes and his anger is directed specifically at the people who were responsible for starting the war uh, which is the uh, military Japanese government and the people who were responsible for dropping the bomb uh, on Hiroshima um, so putting those two parties together um, I think that's really powerful because it it breaks you out of thinking about like national nation versus nation. You know what I mean? Like when we think in terms of nation, like, oh, you're American, Japanese, or whatever, like like Habashi no Gen, he's like he's shaking his fist at the militarists who started the war in Japan and the militarists who dropped the bomb on Hiroshima so callously uh, from America, you know? And like for me, when you connect the militarists, you know, uh, on the top, the people who are, yeah, we need to sell these weapons, we need to use these weapons, it's okay because blah, blah, blah. Then you also connect the people on the bottom, the people who are having the bombs dropped on them, and the people who are suffering because of all of their resources are going to uh, the military and to militarism. Um, so, yeah, to me, that's powerful. And I, like... I put a lot of like emotional energy uh, into that, and hopefully, you know, I'll be able to like, amplify that voice. Wow, I'd love to read it. Uh, good luck with finishing it. And it sounds like you're you're giving talks about it, uh, going around doing seminars as well. Uh, you did one recently in Seda, where you were based as a, as a jet. Is that right? And a beautiful area, rural Hiroshima, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's a, it's a it's a home for me. It's it's really a home for me, um, and getting back with the old people and those old mountains, yeah, very very awesome. And then you at one of the protests recently, uh, you talked about uh, reading something from Martin Luther King, Jr. and something that he talked about uh, the need to be guided by truth and love. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. How do you keep yeah. your your hope not get too depressed by things continuing and things that seem overwhelming? How do you keep your focus on uh, living a good life and doing what you can? I mean, all I want to do as what I can do. I, I think that we're only responsible for the things that are under our, our, our control. And um, I think at any given time, 
it, it seems like we're at a crossroads or, you know, we're at the precipice. And it always seemed like that. I think if you go back in history, we always feel like we're at a crossroads or at the precipice, you know what I mean? But that's the way human beings kind of process it. I don't look at it like that. I look at it more like an ongoing tug of war. And like, which direction do you want to pull it? You know what I mean? And so I'm just trying to like put all the resources that I have into my control into pulling in what I see as the right direction. And, um, and just believe, you know? Like, um, there's a great quote that I can't think of right now, <laughs> but it's something like, you know, um, hold on, maybe I'll find it. Um, um, okay, but uh, it's, you know, not by sight, but by faith kind of thing, I think. Um, and just believe in that, you know, it, it will make a difference, even if we don't see it, you know, and um, having fun. <laughs> well, thank you for everything you're doing, Ashley, uh, with all your work with education, peace education, writing your dissertation, and even with ProRes. I, I love your energy. I love all <laughs> the positive things you're putting out there into the world. I'm, I'm grateful that you are also here in Hiroshima fighting the good fight. Thank you so much for joining today. <laughs> Thank you so much for this opportunity. I've, I've been watching your stuff for a long time and now to be actually on it and doing it with you is a real honor. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And thanks everyone for watching. And of course, as always, if you have any questions or comments, please write them below. Ashley, how can people get more involved? Any advice for people at the end? Um, I think, you know, like being in community with people who share your values, you know what I mean? Find them. They're out there. Other people are not okay with what's going on. And if you find them, you can double your efforts and redouble your efforts and redouble your efforts. Awesome. Thank you so much. Everyone take care of yourself and think about taking care of others as well. Have a good night, folks. Take care. See you next time. Thanks, Bye Ashley. I just carry on as if nothing's wrong And I'll let you